Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. Our our good friend, Sean P. Diddy Combs, in hot water, in a little bit of trouble with the government. Um, feds search P. Diddy's mansions in uh, Miami on Star Island and uh, here in Beverly Hills um, because of allegations of sex trafficking and I think uh, rape and drugs and assault, sexual assault and more rape and the uh, rape of his uh, uh, the, the uh, sexual assault of the men, his male bodyguards, he's goosing, and he's got this singer Cassie. He did a bunch of shit to her, and he's just raping out there in Miami and the raping in Beverly Hills, and then he's got a jet where he's raping. And he's touching people where they shouldn't be touched. He's flying them in. He's trafficking them in from one place to another place so they can get raped. This is the allegations. He's rude. He's rude to people. That's also in there. He's like not a good boss. The last thing you need is to be raped by an asshole. You know what I mean? Like you want... You want a considerate guy if you're sex trafficked to P. Diddy's mansion, you want someone to at least, you know, you know, shake your hand. How are you doing? Do you feel like uh, this position is, uh, you think you're working out here? Do you think you have a future here? How do you feel about where you are? You know, you know, he was a real hard ass during the quarterly review with a lot of these people. From what I hear, he was abusive, uh, angry, nasty, impatient, cannot stand. But P. Diddy, uh, they, they're saying now, we believe that there is a disturbing history of sex trafficking, said the Miami-based officer who spoke under the condition of anonymity. We are responding to concrete, detailed, explicit allegations. This is not random. We didn't choose his name out of a hat. This is a cop talking, by the way. (laughs) He's like, just so that you know, we didn't choose his name out of a hat. The cop's like, listen, here's the way it works. Most of these people are sex trafficking. (laughs) Every now and then, we're allowed to investigate one or two of them. You see, it's not random. We know that most people are sex trafficking people at that uh, level of income. Most people are doing things like that. But every now and then the dam breaks on one of them. It's just too big to ignore. It was Epstein. Now somehow it's Diddy. Uh, But we didn't pick his name out of a hat. Now, what would have been great is if he said, now we could have picked his name out of a hat. And then that person most likely would have had sex slaves as well. Because that's just kind of the way a lot of this seems to be working. We don't know. We became aware of certain allegations during the course of civil suits against Mr. Combs, said the officer. You have to understand that we didn't just decide on a whim to search his homes. This isn't a witch hunt. They're trying to make other rich people feel better, by the way. This is like the cop, like these statements are like make P. Diddy's neighbors kind of relax a little bit. They're like, we got no quarrel with you, all right? Don't worry about it. We're not randomly going into everybody's house. Where are the sex slaves? Get that blanket up. You know, we're not doing that. We got to have detailed allegations and permission from someone to go in and do this. It is interesting. Diddy's been doing shit like this forever. He's like secretly a a bisexual closeted dude. He likes getting with the dudes as well. Nothing wrong with that, but you can't rape them, Sean. He's into the sex trafficking as well. And he's been into it for a while and everybody kind of knew it. And apparently for whatever reason now, 
I love his attorney. He goes, in a statement, his attorney, uh, some guy named Dyer, decried the Department of Homeland Security raids as, quote, a gross overuse of military-level force as search warrants were executed at Mr. Combs' residences. Here we go. The DHS operative said those who had been interviewed for the investigation have been through have been thorough and detailed. That's a funny thing about victims. They may be reluctant to speak at first, but once they start talking, they talk. They talk a lot. We're getting a lot of cooperation from a lot of people who want to see him brought to justice. Diddy was stopped from boarding a private jet out of the US, call my friends at Titan Aviation, on Monday and is believed to have remained in Florida since. He was trying to get out. Diddy was trying to get out. He's facing a full revolt. All of the people he sex trafficked are, are turning on him now. He's, he's, he's facing a... It's like uh, his own little January 6th. He is basically done. He's finished. This guy's involved in some very bad stuff. He was very instrumental in a lot of people's careers. Usher, Bieber. Who knows what he's done to people? Who knows what he's responsible for? Who knows the abuses? I get the feeling that a lot of people in Hollywood get abused. And, and, and it's kind of part of their personality. When you meet some of these people out here, they have the personality of somebody who's been horrifically abused. I don't know if that's true or not. I just know that occasionally I'll meet somebody and if someone said to me, you know, in their past, uh, they were horrifically abused by someone, I wouldn't be like, no way. I go, yeah, I get. They, there's some of them that kind of look off they look off in the, di- you know, they're not fully with you. They're not fully with you. They're somewhere else. And maybe that's just they're distracted, but maybe, you know, it's like they were uh, put in like a room or something. I don't know. Some of them were in a cage. Do you think Bieber has been, uh, I don't know. He's a legend and I don't disparage the man at all. I wonder if he had to deal with any of that because... This is a town that is famous for young children being um, molested. Let's watch this video everybody's uh, talking about here. Uh, uh, P. Diddy and Justin Bieber. Justin, he's in, you ever seen the movie 48 Hours? Right now, he's having 48 Hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, like, yeah. like the, you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we, we can't really disclose, but, um, it's definitely a 15 year old's dream. He's a good um, guy, this guy. You know, I, I, I have been given custody of him. You know, he's he signed a good to guy Usher. to take custody of a young I, singer. I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when, you know, well, that's he, nice. he did his first album. I did yes. Usher's first album. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the right. next 48 hours, right. he's with you me. Do. You do. So, um, you own him yeah, for the next 48 hours, but you don't legally. Fool. Have him. Full, crazy. This is a good guy. This is a good guy because most people, when they're managing these young children, don't, uh, you know, have legal guardianship over them. But I think it's a, I mean, that seems like a good idea. <laughs> but maybe nothing, listen, I'm not trying to open up that can of worms. I'm saying that's, you know, people are out there saying that. That, that, I don't know, that, uh, that Diddy's a, it was a strange guy. You know, I, I'm, 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 I withhold judgment on it until more facts come to light. Right now, right now, it, all it looks to me is like Diddy sex trafficked a bunch of people to his houses in Miami and, and Beverly Hills, which I, again, I, I can't get that angry at just because. You know, I don't even know what that means. What does that even mean? Uh, no, I'm, I'm dead serious now. He's, what does sex trafficking mean? And I would say this if I, if I was representing him in court. 
I'd go, what is sex trafficking? I almost want to call this hotline and ask them what it is. Because people ask me, go, what is it? Are they kidnapped? Are they underage? Do they not know what's going on? They get on the plane. Is Diddy threatening them? He's telling them they can't leave. He's kidnapped. Is it kidnapping? Is it, what does he do? Can this guy not get legal? I mean, not legal whores, I guess, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, like a whore. Can you get a whores? Aren't there enough whores who want to do this? This is my question with all these people doing the sex trafficking. All these guys doing the sex trafficking, uh, haven't we in this country done enough to promote whores? Aren't there enough whores in this country for everyone? Why do we need to sex traffic? I mean, I'm genuinely curious. Everywhere I look, there are whores everywhere. People are putting things in their ass on OnlyFans to make $6. They're, they won't come over and fuck you in a mansion in Miami? You can't get into... Don't we have enough above-board whores in this country so that you can stop sex trafficking? And by the way, it's expensive, sex trafficking. All these people are on planes all the time. It's not cheap. I've been trying to get a flight out of LA for two days. You can't. Very difficult because a fucking spring break and whatever else and Easter. But in a country where we do nothing but encourage everyone to be a whore, this is what we encourage in every way, by the way. Not only sexually, but in every way, we encourage you to spread your cheeks in this country for a dollar. Anything. OF, IG, put your pussy on the street. Old school, whatever. Marry for money. I'm all for it. We preach the gospel of whore in this country. And we somehow don't have enough of them to go to Diddy's house in Miami. He's got to traffic them in. He's got to hold them against their will. Aren't there enough? And I obviously, I'm against sex trafficking. We're against it. For those of you who are dumb... We're against it. We're clearly against anyone being abused or anyone who's underage. My simple question is this, and it's always been my question when I hear about these things. With Epstein, it's different because he had a predilection for underage victims, women. With old Diddy thing, if that's the case, that's the case. I don't know if it's the case or not. It might be. But my whole thing is like, I am shocked that in a country where OnlyFans is a major part of our economy. It is a major pillar of our economy. I mean, there is literally the son of an OnlyFans model admits he films his mother's porn. A son of an OF model just came out and says, I film mommy's porn. It's a part of our economy now. Okay, right here. Son of OnlyFans model admits he films content for her. This is a part of the economy. While most teenage sons can't be bothered up unloading the dishwasher for their mothers, this one goes above and beyond. Andressa Urak is a successful OnlyFans content creator and boasts over 3 million followers on Instagram. The former Miss Bum Bum model hails from Brazil, do you see what I mean about the whores under every rock? There's a whore in here. There's a whore in the cup. We put the bear in. The former Miss Bum Bum. I mean, it's like, what is this country full of Jacqueline Kennedys and Virgin Marys? You can't get beat. The former Miss Bum Bum model hails from Brazil. Prior to her OnlyFans career, she was a successful dancer. Probably not in the Nutcracker. While many creators might hire someone to film their content, Andresa decided to keep the business within the family and her son shoots things for her. During an Instagram Q&A last summer, her son Arthur, who was 18 at the time, was asked, Arthur, are you the one who films your mother's OnlyFans? He replied, yep, I'm really badass with the pictures, right? For many people, the idea of shooting such content for our parents would be well unimaginable. But Arthur appeared unfazed. But while he doesn't seem to be bothered, others were, religious groups in particular. Yeah. So, I mean, this is what 
we got going on. We got kids shooting OnlyFans content for their mother, Miss Bum Bum. And <laughs> suppose, supposedly, there's not enough Miss Bum Bums to go over to the house. It's like R. Kelly, pee on an adult. Pee on an adult. <laughs> pee on a consenting adult. It still probably gets you off. Maybe not as much. Pee on a... Can that be the moral message of, of America? Can we just settle on that? Can we, I don't want to be Cotton Mather, the old uh, Protestant preacher. I'm not trying to be a, a crazy lunatic here. I'm not trying... Uh, but uh, if we're constantly in the throes of... Uh, the, we're, we're hearing all the time about this Christian revival we're having. Can we just settle on this very nice moral message? Pee on a consenting adult. Can we do that? Can we do that? It confuses me. It confuses me. It confuses me that, that all of these people that get busted for these things, but it's, but it's not about sex, they say. Tim, it's about power. It's about power. It's not about sex. It's not about people just coming. It's about power. It's about threats and locking people up and taking away their freedom and, you know, making sure it's about control, right? This is what it is. Three other women have filed lawsuits in the Southern District of New York alleging that Comb sexually assaulted them. Two said they were teenagers at the time. Combs has denied each of these allegations, calling them sickening. So listen to this. A former employee who worked for Combs uh, also filed a lawsuit in February alleging that Combs sexually harassed, drugged, and threatened him for more than a year. In his suit, Rodney Lowrod Jones, producer, also alleged that he had video and audio evidence of Combs, his staff members, and others engaging in serious, illicit activity. They're taking him down. He's going down. P. Diddy. Sad. Part of my childhood. Part of my childhood. I saw uh, Taylor Swift the other day at Nobu. This is true. I walked in. I had a couple of guys that opened for me on the road. And one of them, I said, some celebrities go here sometimes at Nobu Malibu. And one of them was real, you know, kind of like, <laughs> but this is like a guy who's from like North Dakota or something. You know what I mean? It's a place where people grow up eating Pop-Tarts and stuff. And so he doesn't know what sushi is or, you know, he doesn't understand anything. So we, we take him in and he goes, um, he goes, oh, yeah, celebrities here. You know who ends up showing up? Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Robert De Niro. I was like, these are some of the biggest celebrities in the world. Taylor Swift is the biggest celebrity in the world. She gets on a table I swear to God, she stands up on a table in Nobu Malibu, and I'm not lying to you, and I don't want people, because this was, she literally said, this is between us. She made everyone put their phones down. She gets on a table. Do you want to hear what she does? She starts hiling Hitler on a table, going, I love Hitler. And see, this is what I mean. This is why she's so, she's, so she's going, I love Hitler. And then everyone in the restaurant, people are going, we love him too. Because no one can tell this woman otherwise. She is so powerful. She is so rich that nobody can tell her anything other than that. She did it as a gag. She did it as a goof to just get up there and say, I love Hitler. And then everyone starts hiling Hitler as well. The Japanese guys doing the sushi. These chubby little girls who are taking photos, trying to get, get they're all doing it. Everybody's hiling Hitler. You know, and I just think it's, I don't think someone should have all that power. That's my question. Does Taylor Swift have too much power? I think so. Lego asked Social Police Department to stop using toy heads on mug shots. Lego doesn't like this. Lego doesn't like this. What's happening is the, uh, the Murrieta Police Department hides the identities of suspects by editing Lego heads onto their faces in accordance with a new law. Show us. Yeah, this is, so this is one. Um, here's another example of what they've done. Yeah, so pe I guess this is because people, they don't want to show you who the people are. Yeah, they protect them for anonymity. Yeah. Isn't there a company that wouldn't mind it? <laughs> There's got to be a company that wants the press. 
It's not because Le- Lego's doing well. You need to find a company that needs a fucking boost. Put a Quiznos sub over their faces. They'll love it. Quiznos is, has been destroyed. They have like nothing left. You got to find a company that's, yeah, see here, this is, <laughs> see Lego's not going to, because now, now people are getting the image that le- le- the Lego people are just criminals. <laughs> they're, they're looking at, people are like, oh, these Lego people are, are uh, people that drive drunk. And they don't want this, but you got to find a company that doesn't mind. You got to find a company to see, you know, try a peanut butter cup, head, try something else. Try something where people don't mind, you know, a little monster energy can. There's got to be a company that doesn't mind. Lego is too big. Lego is way too big. They don't need the free advertising. This is a free advertising, essentially. But there are companies that don't care. What about uh, Dylan Mulvaney from Bud Light? Remember that fun, that fiasco? Make Dylan Mulvaney, give uh, everyone a Dylan Mulvaney head. You know, I don't know. I don't know what to do here, except find a company that needs the press. Find someone who needs the press. Find a fucking creator that uh, one of these LA creators that doesn't care and they've had their soul surgically removed and all they care about is getting more followers and likes and engagement. Use, hey, I like David Dobrik. Use David Dobrik's head on every criminal. <laughs> the Murrieta Police Department put David Dobrik. His career has kind of slid a little and it's really th- not even his fault. You know, because of that other thing that the other guy did. <laughs> Use David Dobrik's head so people will go, who's that? And you go, oh, it's David Dobrik. That starts a fun conversation. You go, wait, well, who is that guy? Well, he's big on the internet. He was even bigger, but his friend did a thing, and he kind of took the heat for it. You got to use uh, somebody. We should do that. By the way, we should just reserve it for whoever got busted for sex trafficking last. <laughs> like it should be Diddy's head on all the criminals. And before that, it was Weinstein's head. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with prize picks. The number one, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on prize picks. America's number one fantasy sports app. I've said that now twice, but it's true. So you say true things a lot. <laughs> Want to play alongside some former prize picks favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in prize picks community each week. Conference tournaments are here, which means the biggest moments in college basketball are getting closer. Be a part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. Prize Picks even offers injury assurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, the player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I've used this, my family has used it, and my friends use it. Download the app today and use code TIM for a first deposit match of up to $100. Download the app today and use code TIM for a first deposit match up to $100. So many people are so stressed out buying tickets, and I agree with, you know, that assessment because I've been stressed out myself. I just download the Game Time app, and I've been using it, and it's made ticket buying so much easier. I mean, pick out specific concerts, games, or other events that you'd love to attend. I love it. You know, it's so easy. Last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. Easy to find to buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Views from all seats in the venue, lowest price guaranteed, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, et cetera. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events anywhere near you. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices. You can get all the views from your seat. You know exactly what you're going to be looking at and the lowest price guaranteed. 
Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code TIM for 20% off your first purchase. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code TIM for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code TIM for $20 off. But yeah, I mean, whoever we're shaming in the country, and maybe for good reason, but who whoever has run afoul of the machine, whoever has run afoul of the machine, I- instead of a Lego head, we use their head on the uh, criminals. I think that makes a good, uh, that makes sense. Drag show for Palestine canceled in Arizona. I find myself again... Against all odds, talking about Arizona. I try not to, and yet it comes, it comes for me. There was apparently a drag show for Palestine that was planned in uh, Arizona, and uh, it was canceled. Um, The drag queen, Daddy Satan, has said that this incident inspired them to plan an even larger event. Listen to me right now, folks. If a drag queen in Arizona named Daddy Satan cannot have a drag show to support solidarity with the Palestinians, what are we even doing? What did we fight World War II for? Everybody, you ever see the movie Saving Private Ryan when they were storming the beaches of Normandy? You know why they were doing it? Someone should have told them. Someone should have whispered in their ear. Do you know why you guys are doing this? Because one day there'll be a drag queen named Daddy Satan who lives in Arizona and they will want to do a uh, a Solidarity with Palestine march. Um, We're all very bummed about it, but appreciate the outpouring of love and support from the community, said Daddy Satan. So many people put a lot of work into this. By the way... (laughs) Daddy Satan, I have to call you out a little bit there. Wait a minute. Hold on. (laughs) How many people... (laughs) Daddy Satan, I think you're uh, overstating it a little bit. He goes, so many people put a lot of work into this, and it just goes to show how much support is behind Palestine. I've always said... um, I've always said that... uh, it was a failing... You know, Israel's whole uh, contention here... When this whole thing started, they were like, you can't even be gay in uh, Palestine. Okay. But you can't really be anything in Palestine, right? It's not like a nice place to live. So Israel's like, you can't be gay in Palestine. So what we have to do to help the gay Palestinians is kind of kill all of them. And so which was an interesting logical jump, but I get it. I understand that. Because it, it's better, I guess, you know, if you can't be uh, gay in Palestine, why even be alive? So now they really can't be gay. They might have been quietly gay. Now they're just quiet. Now the point is here, and I, I'm i not taking sides in the whole thing. I do feel it. The UN's now called for a ceasefire. I've had quite enough of all of it. I've had quite enough of all of it. The drag queen clarified on Saturday that the event was canceled because the other drag queens in the venue were facing bullying and getting caught in the crossfires of hate. That's just a great name for everything. The crossfires of hate. Daddy Satan's new book, The Crossfires of Hate. Daddy Satan, I'm calling it right now, will be a congressman soon or congresswoman. And Daddy Satan will write a book called The Crossfires of Hate. Let's take a look at Daddy Satan. Does Daddy Satan have, like, is uh, fun? Looking right here, Let's see if we can get Daddy Satan. Yeah! (laughs) That's right. Look at the names here. So all of these people uh, were supposed to do this event, and it was Christian Caliente, Jake in the Box, Marlene Marvelous, Piss Understood... (laughs) I like piss understood. Alexander Strike and Deshauna Rose. And this was going to be at uh, the Palabras Bilingual Bookstore, 906 West Roosevelt Street, Phoenix, Arizona. And it was hosted by the great Daddy Satan. 
the drag queen uh, for Palestine. What's fun about all of this stuff is, um, you know, community really is where you find it. You know? It's just where you find it, folks. We have this whole thing in America now where we're talking about loneliness, and this is what I wanted to address this and talk about this, because the... The, the ruling class every now and then likes to kind of, they really like to take the spotlight off themselves. God bless them. They like to kind of step out of the spotlight every now and then, the ruling class. God love them. And what they're doing now, if you've noticed this, they are, this new thing is being pushed. I'm telling you, and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to understand it immediately. Uh, the new uh, billionaire thing, because for a while they tried. Now, if you remember, like we, we we always look at Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal and uh, Insider, all these where they push this kind of like junk science. They see it's like an open mic for billion. They try to see like what can, uh, what sticks. They throw things out. They're like, you don't need a kitchen. Remember that article? They're like, you don't. People don't need kitchen. They don't need dining rooms. Americans are happy with smaller houses. And then they do the whole thing where it's like, nobody really wants to retire. People like working till they die. The new thing now that they're um, workshopping, they're workshopping this. They're uh, they're doing this. This is USA Today, another uh, offender. Americans are lonely and it's killing them. How the U.S. can combat this new epidemic. So the, the, the ruling class now is pushing this narrative. You're dying because you're lonely. It's not the food. It's not the shitty health care. It's not the jobs. It's not the unaffordability of everything. It's because you're sad. You're sad. You have your friends. That's what uh, the billionaire class is now pushing. They're pushing this idea that the biggest epidemic in America is not opioids. <laughs> it's loneliness. That's what's killing everybody. It's because they're lonely. Uh, we've done the studies. We figured it out. Nothing more to see here. It has nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. It is lonely. You don't have any friends. You don't have friends. And they'll hang out with you. So what they're trying to do, and it's, just, it's all quite brilliant, by the way. It is spread like wildfire. All of these articles, loneliness is the plague. It is the plague. People are lonely. Loneliness only gets worse. These are the articles too. Loneliness only gets worse as you age. Ignore loneliness. Listen, we all know friends are great. Communities are great. Social engagements are wonderful. We know that Technology has made the world uh, more lonely and more isolating, okay? But whenever I see a coordinated attempt to push a narrative, um, I always have to question why, okay? So let's just, just here, go back to that next page. Loneliness is at epidemic levels, Okay. Health and Human Services, our epidemic of loneliness. NPR, America has a loneliness epidemic. All of these places are saying you are lonely and that is your issue. That is why uh, you are uh, miserable. Now, we've said on the show many, many times that the decline of social activities is a thing. The great book... Bowling Alone, which I've referenced several times. They're not necessarily all wrong here. But to say that it's the only issue and it's the, uh, the only prevalent concern in people's lives is that they are lonely and that is what is uh, killing them. It takes a lot of pressure off any of these companies that don't have to change anything they're doing. You know what makes you less lonely? Affording a home in a community of other people. That might make you less lonely. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't really address that. They don't say the lack of affordability is killing America. They don't say that. They say it's loneliness. 
They don't say drugs coming in from the southern border like fentanyl are killing me. They go, it's lonely. You're alone. You're alone and you're dying. So what are you supposed to even do? By the way, what are you supposed to do? What would you do? What would be the, uh, what would be the, what would be the response to that? If you're, if you are lonely, make a friend. Also, read a book. You could work on yourself. You could learn things. There are a lot of things you can do when you're alone that can significantly and substantially better your life. And there's a lot of groups of people that are groups of losers that will only destroy your life. The people that write these articles would rather you in one of those, by the way. It's loneliness. That's the biggest problem. You think if you went through the projects and you talk to people and you go, what do you think the big issues are here? You think you get loneliness? <laughs> I'm asking. You go, what do you think the big issues are? <laughs> in fact, in many of the areas where you have lots of problems in America, people seem to be hanging out quite often. You know? Diddy wasn't lonely. He had lots of people around. <laughs> Is loneliness the reason for uh, Sean P. Diddy Combs' problems? Was it all loneliness? When you are lonely, there are lots of things you can do. You can work on your mental, physical health. You can get degrees. You can read books. I'm not saying that you can't. You should make friends. You should participate in the community. You should be trying to maybe get into a relationship if that's something that you want. But this idea that we can offload all of the problems in America on simply loneliness, that's it. And there's nothing else to blame. There's nobody else to blame, and we can't do anything other than tell you that you're lonely. People that are lonely know that they're lonely. How about making fucking shit cheaper? Schools cheaper. They can meet people in school. They can't afford to go. You could do that, make school cheaper, and then lonely people could go to school and fucking take an archaeology class or something. I don't know. That might help. You might meet somebody fun in the archaeology class. You know? One in three Americans feels lonely. Let's read this one. Psychiatry.org. One in three Americans feels lonely every week. So this is another thing, by the way. This is the way. Here's what we're going to do. I can, tell, can I call it? Can I call it right now? Can I call it right now? We're creating a new disease of, to which we'll be medicated. I'm telling you right now, listen to, heed what I am saying. This is like when they try to claim everyone's autistic now. It's not true. Everyone's not autistic. Some people are, but not every... I hear all that go out to dinner with people, and they go, well, you know, everyone is autistic now. It's the toxins in the wood. <laughs> it's the toxins in the wood. It's actually... There's actually chemicals in the chair, and now everybody's autistic, and no one can even blink. You go, oh, oh, is that it? I don't think so. There are autistic people, but they're not all over the place. They're not falling out of the cupboard. They're just, you know, people make it sound like when you walk through, uh, a, you know, I don't know, so a, a de department store, you're just tripping over people that are severely autistic. That's not true. Yes, there is more autism now, but not everyone. And let's, they're expanding the autism de definition to include literally anyone. Literally anyone. If you take more than a second to order a meal and you're looking at a restaurant menu, that's now considered autistic. What I'm saying is loneliness is coming as a treatable uh, malady. I'm telling you, this is why they do this stuff. Because what they're saying to people is, you are, uh, uh, this is killing you. Notice the words. You are being killed by loneliness. They're not telling you, hey, loneliness is part of the human condition. Everybody in their life is going to occasionally feel loneliness at some times or others. Some people are going to be more lonely than others. Some people have lots of friends around them and they're still lonely. What they are saying is that loneliness is this epidemic that is killing you. And if something is an epidemic that is killing you, cha-ching, cha-ching, here comes Pfizer, here comes Merck, here comes Novartis, here comes all of these different companies. They are going to, they're going to queue up a drug that I guess makes you feel not lonely when you're alone. There will, this is, a, it'll be some drug, you know, and it'll be called, you know, uh, 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 Frenzum. 
Friendsum. Have you tried Friendsum? Well, Friendsum actually simulates the kind of feelings that you have when you're having exchanges with people, although you can be alone in your townhouse. Try Friendsum. I'm telling you, I it usually I I should use it because I've talked about this issue on the show before, and I don't disagree that the erosion of America's social fabric has contributed to a lot of problems. I would be stupid to disagree with that, okay? Um, I don't think that people writing these articles really care about that. I think they're trying to make loneliness into a disease that can be medicated. This is my guess. I could be wrong. When Americans feel lonely, they reported e easing these feelings uh, th through many different means. And by the way, they will start linking this to, look, look, 50% find a distraction like TV, podcasts, or social media. So you know the next thing here. You're listening to podcasts because you're lonely. That's why you're like, And some of that, sure, but it's going to be like, well, they embrace these conspiracy theories because they're lonely. They question the government because they're lonely. And you're going to go, oh, wait a minute. So if I question anything at all, it's because you're lonely. You don't have any friends. Why are we giving all this money to the Ukraine? You don't have any friends. <laughs> I don't understand why eight-year-olds should medically change their gender. You're a lonely fuck. That's why you spend all day thinking about this. You don't have any friends. Oh, I guess so. You need to go to a therapist and you need to get on our new drug now. It's all about figuring out ways to stigmatize and marginalize anyone that questions anything, by the way. Anyone that questions anything is immediately stigmatized and marginalized in some way. And then we need to put everybody on a drug and we need to, everybody needs to subscribe to the program. And if you're not subscribed to the program, you're an antisocial person. We cut off the social media. We get you out of here. You're bothering us. You're bothering us. Ask a question, but so this is what I mean about the whole lonely thing. I've, it's coming on strong now, isn't it? The loneliness. It's every art. Every article is lo you're lonely. We have gotten everyone in this country on meds for depression, for anxiety. Everybody, P young people are taking so many SSRIs. Nobody's dick works anymore. There's that we are. Everybody's on ADD. Everybody's on meds for everything. Now we're just, you know, including anything that might be, and I'm not saying that there are there are a lot of people that need medication and should take it. A thousand percent. My mother was one of them. There are depressed people, people with anxiety, people that need medication. There are also people that are making themselves sick. Our culture makes them sick. Okay? Our food makes them sick. Our media diet makes them sick. Uh, the constant um, disorientation, this disorienting uh, uh, landscape that we all live in where up is down and down is up and black is white and white is black and questioning any of it, you're, uh, you're uh, called a psychopath, makes, makes people a little uneasy. There's all kinds of things, but this is very strange. Clearly, we believe technology can be used to connect with others. In some cases, however, it seems to be helping us reach people who become part of our inner circles. Da, 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 da. However, distracting yourself and you're feeling lonely with social media might be a double-edged sword. While it can connect, it can also lead to feelings of missing out. So it, very soon it will. we are going to have some type of cure for this, and we're just going to put it, a, a lot of people on uh, drugs. That's just... The pharmaceutical industry makes more money than any other business in America. I think we're number... It's number one. Pharmaceutical uh, business is number one. And all of these articles right now do not seem to me to be a genuine concern for people. They seem to be the precursor to how do we cure loneliness. Jared Kushner says Gaza waterfront property might be very valuable. I called this. I said this a long time ago. And, you know... He said it could be very valuable. Let's take a look here at Jared Kushner, who is weighing in on the real estate opportunities in Gaza, of which, by the way, not to sound, I don't want to sound uh, callous, but there will be many, many opportunities. Not for me, 
But for a lot of people um, that own real estate development firms and get these contracts to rebuild, this is, guys, uh, uh, Jared Kushner, we'll listen to him for a little bit. It's two minutes and 30 seconds. Let's, let's hear what he has to say. There's refugees. Turkey took them. Europe took them. Mm -hmm. Jordan took them. For whatever reason, here in Gaza, there's refugees from the fighting, from an offensive uh, attack that was staged from Gaza. Israel's going in to do, um, you know, a long-term deterrence mission. And it's just, it, it's unfortunate that nobody's taking the refugees. But also, there are real fears on the part of Arabs, and I'm sure you talk to a lot of them, who think once Gazans leave Gaza, Netanyahu's never going to let them back in. No, he will at the Four um, Seasons. Maybe, but I'm not sure there's much left of Gaza at this point. So, you know, if you think about even the construct like, you know, Gaza, Gaza was not really a historical precedent, right? It was the result of, of a war, right? You had tribes that were in different places, but then Gaza became a thing. Uh, Egypt, you know, used to run it. And then, you know, over time, you had different governments that came in different ways. So you have another war, you know, usually when wars happen, um, you know, borders are changed historically over time. Yeah, the new government's so coming is, is called is, the I would Saint say, Regis. How do we deal with <laughs> the terror coming. threat that is there so that it cannot be a threat to Israel or to Egypt, right? I think that both sides are spending a fortune on military. I think neither side uh, really wants to have, you know, a terrorist organization enclaved right between them. I mean, Gaza's waterfront property. It could be uh, very valuable That's to That's right. The, uh, only, people... the only terror you're going to experience is how early you have to get up to get a beach chair by the pool. Come on! <laughs> You want to talk about terror? We had to wake up at seven. That's prime real estate by that pool. I called it, I said it years ago, months ago, weeks ago, I don't know, time's a construct, but I said when this war started that there was going to be a lot of uh, luxury properties, hotels in Gaza, and that I even interact, I, I, I acted out how awkward it was going to be when you had a white couple there from Texas and this is maybe 10 years or 20 years from now and then you have like a young person, uh, let's say he's like 19 and he delivers the eggs Benedict to the room and she's going to go, oh my God, are you like from the area? And he's going to go, yes. And she's going to go, wow, does your family still live here? And he's going to go, no. And she's going to go, oh, interesting. Did they like retire? They were all killed in the war. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we had two juices, and I only see one. I only see one. I'll have to go back on Scuffed Realtor, and we, we, me and Nick Ruckerford might have to do an entire uh, uh, Gaza Strip real estate thing, because, I mean, it is... It is quite beautiful. People have asked me to talk about um, uh, the uh, sociopath essay. I always knew I was different. I'm a, socio a sociopath essay, and this is about a woman who is coming into her own as a sociopath. Um, and, yeah, I mean, by the way, if you saw her, would you need the article? <laughs> would you need the article if you saw her? I always knew I was different. I just didn't know I was a sociopath. I kind of like this woman. I don't know anything about her. I like how she goes, I know I'm not alone. It's like, yeah, you're not alone. You're in great company. <laughs> you know, by the way, you know what's probably a cure for being lonely? Being a sociopath. That might help. I started stealing before I could talk. At least I think I did. By the time I was six or seven, I had an entire box full of things I'd stolen in my closet. Somewhere in the archives of People Magazine, there's a photo of Ringo Starr holding me as a toddler. We're standing in his backyard, not far from L.A., where my father was an executive of the music business. And I'm literally stealing the glasses off his face. I was not the first child to ever play with grown-ups' glasses, but based on the spectacles currently perched on my bookshelf, I'm pretty sure I was the only one to swipe a pair from a beetle. Um, and then she goes on, and I read this article, and she goes on, and she's basically like, hey, I don't feel... I don't have any emotions and uh, I cannot access emotions or empathy or uh, things like that. I didn't understand any of this back then. All I knew was that I didn't feel things the way other kids did. I didn't feel guilt when I lied. I didn't feel compassion when classmates got hurt on the playground. For the most part, I felt nothing and I didn't like the way that nothing felt. So I did things to replace the nothingness with something. By the way, 
She should be so successful. Is she very successful? She's like a decently successful writer, I, I think. You know. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, if you possess the qualities of nothingness, no conscience, you're completely, you know, devoid of any emotion. Do you know how successful you should be? Do you know how many people in America just, for whatever reason, it's hard to put one foot in front of the other because they are sentient beings with thoughts and feelings that are very difficult to master and get under control? After years of study, intensive therapy, and earning a PhD in psychology, I can say that sociopaths aren't bad or evil or crazy. We, simple, we simply have a harder time with feelings. We act out to fill a void. When I understood this about myself, I was able to control it. It's a tragic misconception that all sociopaths are doomed to hopeless, loveless lives. The truth is I share a personality type with millions of others. Well, that's comforting, isn't it? Many of whom have good jobs, close knit families, and real friends. We're sociopaths. We represent a truth that's hard to believe. There's nothing inherently immoral about having limited access to emotional. I, I mean, this is like, she's trying to do like, that she's like Braveheart, but she's a sociopath. Like this is, this is the thing she's trying to, um, she's like, I've been through it all. Her, by the way, she's obviously putting herself forward as like a victim of something. And, 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 She's trying to say that her not caring about anything is something that we should, like, feel bad for. It's an odd, that's an interesting one. She's like, I watch you people burn alive. I feel nothing. Do you know how hard that is? It's kind of a little bit like kind of what Israel was doing where they're like, do you know how tough it is to fire this nuclear weapon at these Palestinians? You know how hard it is to bomb? This hurts me more than it hurts you. It's the old dad hitting you thing. I wish I didn't have to do that. You know how hard it is to light you on fire like that? It's a little interesting, this whole idea where she goes, I'm a sociopath, and the whole thing's about, like, how she's struggled with her identity, her idea. She's like, and at the end, she's like, I stand with millions of other people who don't give a fuck about anything and they have jobs and they have families and just like me they don't care they don't give a fuck because that's what it is it's uh, what sociopathy is you don't care and i'm not telling her to care and uh i'm just saying what you know what do you want from me lady what do you want what is this already can someone was this at the journal or the times who did this wall street what is this for like, does anyone in the Wall Street Journal editorial room go, hey, guys, who is this for? Are we trying to make our sociopath readers feel more comfortable? She has a memoir coming out called Sociopath, a Memoir. Snore. It's going to be a snooze fest because she's not going to confess to, like, killing anyone. I'd rather read Daddy Satan's memoir. I'd rather Daddy Satan than this bitch. Anybody do the Wall Street Journal? By the way, does that person even exist anymore at the Wall Street Journal? Who goes, uh, by the way, who is this for? Why are we doing that? Who benefits from this? Maybe we should run uh, some articles about like these payday loan companies, or uh, which we may be advertising soon. Some of them are lovely. <laughs> uh, but maybe we should run uh, some of these payday loans or these credit scams or like something like that, you know? Maybe we should uh, write something about the deficit or how... No, nah, there's a woman who wrote a novel called Sociopath, a memoir. And we're going to run an excerpt from that because we want people to feel good about being sociopaths. I don't know. I mean, listen, I get it. If you can't feel, it sucks. Some people feel too much. I don't know, but it's an odd. It's, I don't know what she wants from us. Do we need to take this journey with her? Do we need to take this journey... Uh, well, what are we supposed to, we're supposed to talk about this in a book. Well, I found it very interesting that she, through her entire life, just felt nothing. Did you read the chapter where she saw the car accident and she saw the body being taken out and she didn't feel anything? I find, isn't that fascinating, Pearl? Pearl, you know, I saw an accident and I could barely get to sleep for three nights. And I didn't know those people at all. But this woman saying that it didn't bother her one bit. I don't know what you're supposed to take from this. 
Should people act more like her? Is that the game? Should people act more like her? Should people be like, yeah, let me lean into that. Let me lean into that. Let me lean in, baby. I like that no one told her to stop being a sociopath. No one told her to try to get feelings at any point. They just said, just live in your truth. Live in your truth. I'm a sociopath and I'm I'm comfortable. I'm finally comfortable admitting it and living well. I live with my I live with myself. I live with myself and I'm quite happy. She's a sociopath. I mean, it's just such a bore. It's so boring. It's so boring. I assume most of you don't feel. Look at her. Ma'am, you are everybody I know in Santa Barbara. We get it. We get it. That's every mom up there who, like, cares about their kids-ish. Kind of. Sort of. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest personal injury law firm. They have over 100 offices nationwide and more than 1,000 lawyers with $20 billion recovered from over 500,000 clients. Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting to get you full and fair compensation. Submitting an injury claim with Morgan & Morgan is so easy. I'm telling you right now, if you are ever injured, check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. I know people that they, they were dead from these accidents and they came back to life because of how well Morgan & Morgan, how much money they got. People would, the hand comes right out of the grave. Give it to me. Because Morgan & Morgan really cares. They really care, and they'll get you your paper. They'll do it. You just got to trust them. I'm telling you, if you get injured, you got to make it right. Have someone out there make it right. Morgan and Morgan. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash Tim or dial pound law, pound 529, from your cell phone. That's F-O-R, thepeople.com slash Tim or, or pound law, pound 529 from your cell this is a paid advertisement. I'm sick of the guy in succession, uh, this guy Jeremy Strong, talking about that he doesn't know where he is or who he is or what he is. It's shut up. Shut up. Stop interviewing these fucking actors. Shut them up. We cared about, we wanted you as Kendall Roy. Stop this. Enough with this. We don't care about you anymore. The show is over. We will care about you if you would do another cool part. We don't care. This is nuts now. I don't want to hear. I don't want to. I don't want Sydney Sweeney's take on uh, inflation. I don't want to hear about Jeremy Strong. Get them out of here. Get them back when they book another thing. Stop interviewing these people. Stop digging deep. Stop it now. These interviews should be very rare, incredibly rare. We don't care. The question, they go, Whoa, they, this is one of his answers. He goes, the question is such a definitive question. I think of myself as a sieve. The thing that I most understand is creating sort of a negative space so that I can be a vessel for writing and create character through a pastiche of writing and imagination and whatever things activate me. Now, is that all kind of a camouflage? Is that, is that his answer? Yeah, his is the non-bold. Yeah. He's insufferable. Everyone on Succession, I think, had enough with him. Still one of the greatest shows of all time, Succession. It's still one of the greatest. It's still one of the greatest shows uh, of all time. We're so excited to be in the UK. By the time this airs, I will be on my way to the United Kingdom to sit with the royals, to show my support for all. Um, I will be in Belfast. In, in uh, the O2 Apollo in Manchester, the O2 Academy in Glasgow, the Royal Theater uh, in Amsterdam, Royal Albert Hall in London, uh, I don't know, in Copenhagen, whatever that pronunciation is, the House of Culture in Helsinki, Finland, Circus in Stockholm, Sweden, two shows in Dublin, Vicker Street. Then I'm back in the USA, San Jose, Lemoore, California, Schenectady, New York, Port Chester, New York, and Atlantic City, New Jersey, late May. That's going to be a fun one. Capitol Theater, Port Chester, New York as well. Fun one, Ovation Hall at Ocean's Casino Resort. TimDillonComedy.com for any of these tickets that you want to see any and all. 
Tickets, we appreciate you being with us as always. And um, we will be uh, we will be in America in a few weeks if I don't get killed in Paris. Me and Sam Talon are going to Paris and they have the terrorist, uh, what is it again? The terror, the terror warning level, the threat level in Paris has been raised to the highest that it has been in a, very long time. France raises terror alert warning to highest level. Me and Sam Talent are just going to be eating baguettes. And by the way, how hilarious if me and Sam Talent end up taking over the country somehow in like a very Woody Allen bananas, kind of almost like a King Ralph way, where me and Sam Talent are just kind of running France. These two chubby American guys now run France because uh, we were the only ones that... We're able to defeat the terrorists. Don't attack France when I'm there, scum, please. I've not been to Paris in a very long time. I would love to buy a chateau in the South. Don't think me and I told Sam, I said, we are going to the South and we're going to look at a few chateaus. I could get into a chateau. I, of course, would have to start drinking again and learn the language and stop this crap. But we could do all of it, couldn't we? Shouldn't we? Well, thank you. We hope that we've cured your loneliness for an hour here. We hope we've cured your loneliness for an hour. It's not easy. And to Sean Diddy Combs, a man who would have benefited from loneliness, ironically. Imagine that. Many of the people that are going to jail in this country should have been lonelier. But I've always been a fan of P. Diddy. I've always been a fan of the music. Um... You know, and uh, we hope he has a third act, don't we? Don't we hope he has a third act? Just donate some money. Just donate some money. If he was smart, he would donate some money. Just donate some money, P. Diddy. Donate some money. You know, now is the time for P. Diddy to financially back Daddy Satan's drag brunch for Palestine in Arizona. The thing with a guy like P. Diddy is he is talented, even though he's a psychopathic, you know, um, uh, rapist monster. He is talented. He can pick out talent and all that stuff. Do we not want to see P. Diddy maybe knocked down, but could he build himself back up, going to Arizona, picking out the drag, which drag performers are good, you know? Picking out, piss understood. Being like, yeah, you, I really like the way piss understood moves. But Daddy Satan just, damn, Daddy Satan owns the stage. This is, this is what, this is the punishment for P. Diddy. P. Diddy has to go down and judge Daddy Satan's drag for Palestine. It, it's a half hour and it's an hour and a half show. P. Diddy has to go down there and judge it. It's filmed, it's filmed, it's filmed. And then he has to donate some money um, to a cause. And then we put him back. We put him back, but we knock him down real estate-wise. He can't live on Star Island anymore. We knock him down a little bit. We knock him down. He doesn't have to live in Opalaka, but we knock him down. You know? We, we, a condo. You get a nice condo. No more mansions. You can't handle it. No private islands, no mansions. And you're flying commercial. First, this is what I would do if I was a judge. I'd go, you're flying commercial first. And he's like, oh, God, because I know how bad these things are. You fly commercials, first class. You can still do first class. And you're not living in the mansion anymore. You're living in a condo. There's going to be a condo board, and you can't have loud music. He's going to be pissed. And you're judging Daddy Satan's drag brunch for Palestine in Arizona. He's going to be like, God damn it. I'm gonna, but that's it. That's your punishment. None of this jail. You can't throw rich people in jail. It's not fair. Except the renters. It's an inside joke. All right. Good night, everyone.